My mission today is to speak about uh, proximal junctional pathologies and strategies to prevent these pathologies. Um, it's a Herculean mission over the past uh, five or six years in particular because there's been more than 50 or 60 papers uh, published either directly related or indirectly related to preventing uh, proximal junctional pathologies, uh, most of them by the ISSG, ISSG group, which has done a really great job in trying to define and categorize and clearly delineate you know, what we're doing at the proximal junction. And coincident with uh, our quest for trying to gain better sagittal alignment with increasing osteotomies, uh, we are seeing much more of, of this uh, problem. And my mission today is to talk about risk factors, surgical correction, and surgical techniques. Um, The age of sagittal alignment actually started in 2005. Uh, we're all aware of this paper uh, by Glassman, and um, it started here, in my opinion, as uh, we know that the severity of symptoms increases in a linear fashion with progressive positive sagittal balance. And our, our measures, our SF12 and our ODI measures, certainly uh, deteriorate with increasing of uh, sagittal balance. The problem with this paper, though, was that it only looked at the location of the C7 plumb line, if you can see the R values. But it did say that kyphosis and disability were related, and the location of the kyphosis was, was um, really uh, remarkable, and that as the kyphosis moved down the spine, the disability went up. The next paper then talked about spinal uh, harmony among uh, the spinal pelvic parameters by, by uh, Frank Schwab. And then these ideal parameters came out, understanding that the pelvis is really important in understanding spinal pelvic alignment with low SVA and a low PT and proportional lordosis to pelvic incidence became in vogue. Um, and then um, the ASSG looked at parameters as far as what is predictive. And they looked at spinal pelvic parameters that were predictive of, of ODIs greater than 40. And they found that, you know, SVA, PT, and lumbar lordosis and pelvic incidence were really correlated with disability. And the mismatch was a strong correlation to clinical outcome. And that set the stage for um, moving towards getting better harmony in the spinal pelvic area and in our surgery. Um, that then led to, well, I'm old enough to know that when I was a fellow, way back when, my attendings always told me you can never get enough lordosis. And then we talked about head over the pelvis for harmony, and then we, we developed these overcorrections, and then we started to see these large uh, proximal junctional pathologies with kyphotic rates between 20% and 60% and failure rates, you know, up to as high as 6 to 10% in the uh, thoracolumbar junction more than the upper thoracic area. And we have good definitions now, which we didn't have before, which makes this a little bit clearer. Our definitions for a kyphotic angle has always been, or for PJK has always been pretty consistent, and we all know that. Um, but also, more recently, our failure definition has been uh, more clearly defined by the ISSG group. And an angle of 28 degrees and a change of about 22, depending whether you're in the upper thoracic or the thoracolumbar region, region or an antilysthesis that moves eight millimeters in the proximal uh, area, in the upper area, and three millimeters in the lower area. So based on that, that's the context for my talk, right? So we now have better definitions. We now have these parameters. And now we have these theories. Um, soft tissue preservation, force dissipation, tethers, rods, transition rods, hooks, bone health, vertebroplasty, UIV inclination, muscularity, fatty degeneration at the junction, thoracic compensatory mechanisms, pelvic retroversion, metallurgy, titanium rods, pre-bent rods, age-adjusted goals, personalized goals, osteotomy location, predictive modeling, pre-op planning, differences between supine uh, pre-op and intraoperative x-rays and predictive analytics. So 
it's a really large topic, and I have 10 minutes to talk about this, which is a little, was a little overwhelming. So what I did was, is I looked at the literature over the last 10 to 15 years, and I picked papers to talk about today that their conclusions based on sound statistical analysis gave us some reasonable conclusions that we can say these things may work. Most of these papers are level three, some are level two, and they're all from the, um, the majority of them are from the ISSG group and the database. So let's talk about some of these papers and try to come up with some type of idea of where we are today uh, and let's review the papers. So the first paper I picked was, uh, this is a, a landmark paper in my opinion in 2016, which correlated ODI and PCS and found what the normative values are by age. And this paper is important in that it found that we have substantially greater baseline deformity as we get older, and that our sagittal spinal pelvic alignment definitely varies with age. So, you know, the papers from before that looked at ideal alignment, we were overcorrecting because, because of, of the compensatory mechanisms. Now we have a good understanding. If you look at the data in this table five, you can see that, you know, our SVAs um, certainly can uh, go up and we can still have reasonably good uh, clinical outcome with our older patients. What's also important about this paper is that our octogenarian population continues to come into our offices. They're walking sometimes one, two, three miles a day. They have spinal stenosis. They have stenosis throughout their spine. And these, these people are requesting to have their surgeries. Um, it's, this is just a, a landmark paper that tells us that we really don't need to overcorrect these patients. And I think everybody would agree with that. Uh, so the next paper, basically confirms the former paper that the incidence of proximal junctional failure increases with age and that people that had significantly greater sagittal correction, as you can see from table one, uh, they, have, uh, they don't need as much correction. So age-adjusted alignment goals, I think, is powerful. I think we all know that. I don't think that's, that's new to any of us that are giving our talks today, but we can't ignore the fact that that's where we all started. So let's talk about some of the prophylactic measures other than the age adjustment alignment goals. So there was a lot of vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty done years ago. Uh, there's been multiple studies um, out uh, concerning um, vertebroplasty. Uh, the one I picked was from the uh, Johns Hopkins group, uh, the 2017 paper, which really shows us that vertebroplasty might minimize junctional failure in the early postoperative time but it does not decrease the incidence at five years. So for what we thought was a, a reasonably good tool that we had um, is turning out to be um, really not impactful at all. Oh, for some reason, we can't get this slide to move. Ashley, can you help me out there? Thanks. Um, so about, what about the upper instrumented verte, uh, vertebral, vertebral inclination and our rod bending and our rod contouring? Uh, this is a really nice uh, uh, paper by the ISSG group also, which uh, talks about the orientation of the uppermost instrumented vertebra and influences proximal junctional disease. And what they found was, was that a, most, a more posterior construct in inclination was found in patients that had proximal junctional kyphosis. So you can see uh, the definition of the uh, UIV inclination on the left, uh, which basically uh, looks at the uh, three uh, proximal vertebra and their relationship to the uh, vertebral to, to the uh, axis, sagittal axis, and you can see the the uh, X-rays uh, on the right of the screen that show uh, certainly less inclination with with in the lower thoracic spine with no P PJK than with PJK. So proper rod contouring at the proximal end does mean something. And the, uh, the incidence of uh, kyphosis, proximal joshua kyphosis in this paper was certainly higher in the lower uh, thoracic spine than in the upper thoracic spine. And from this paper, we can assume that proximal junctional kyphosis appears as a compensatory phenomenon in response to sagittal overcorrection. The next paper I, I chose was our lordosis distribution. I think a lot of us have known a lot about this 
but we, we never really put it together. And there's been a lot of talk about where our lordosis sits, where it's located, and how important it is. Um, we uh, found out from this paper that proximal lordosis has the, this greatest variation, and an optical correction uh, of the caudal lordosis uh, is important, and um, proximal junctional kyphosis does occur when we try to correct more cephalid, and our osteotomy should be lower. It has a greater impact on pelvic tilt. And the next paper is really have to reach these age adjusted alignment thresholds. So if we're not going to be able to reach the age adjusted alignment thresholds, we undercorrect, we're not doing them any good, and we're certainly not doing any good to the patient when they're overcorrected. So this this actually lends credence to patient specific operative planning and maybe some predictive modeling. Thoracic compensation is important, and you can see from the, the, the three uh, 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 x-rays up on the right, that reciprocal change can create a lot of a lot of proximal junctional failure. And this is, again, the ISSG group, which de demonstrates that thoracic compensation is a really the primary determinant of postoperative kyphosis. And if you get a kyphosis, which is postoperative greater than about 15 degrees, failure is more likely. Talked about tethering. Um, this is a finite element analysis model, which showed that tethering uh, to the upper instrumented vertebra two plus two was better than uh, plus one, was better than hooks, it was better than pedicle screws. Um, next. The type of tethering doesn't really matter, whether it's a loop or a weave, uh, but the, the amount of force across the tether between 50 and 100 newtons is uh, seem to be most effective in mitigating adjacent segment stress based on range of motion and disc pressures based on this finite element analysis study. Next. Um, then this paper on the best strategy, which was uh, by uh, the ISG group, basically talked about alignment, perfect alignment versus tethering. What it basically says was that if you can align the patient to age-adjusted goals and put a tether on the top, they will be better. This paper did not demonstrate a difference between a hook, cement, or a, a tether, um, but it did state that if you can align the patient and use some implants to uh, prophylactically, you can avoid uh, failure. Predictive modeling can give an accuracy of 86%, and maybe we shouldn't be operating on some of these patients. The point of this paper is maybe these patients are too frail, they, they might have too many comorbidities, and we shouldn't be putting them through this operation. And this is another paper that talks about frailty. Um, the odds ratio of developing proximal junctional failure were much higher for the severely frail and frail patients in this study. So age-adjusting goals are very important. Patients with high pelvic incidence don't require rigorous realignments. Contour your rods. Beware of thoracic compensation. Tethers seem to help with, sagittal, with avoiding sagittal overcorrection. Lower osteotomies are better. Try to use a frailty index and a predictive model if you're not sure if, if you should even operate on the patient. And as an adult deformity surgeon, this is what I feel like when I go into the operating room, always walking a tightrope. It's a balancing act. We have a lot of things to think about. Um, and I think if we do it the right way, certainly in, in today, we can help our patients much better than we can 10 years ago. Thank you. Oh, that's a great talk, a great uh, final slide. Was that, uh, is that taken at Fenway or where was that photograph? Do you know? I think it was Yankee Stadium. That was oh. a great little well, Linda. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Great. Uh, well, we do have some time for some questions. Anyone from the audience? Uh, uh, or remotely, I'm trying to see the chat. David Polly, I know you have a question. So oh, Bob, um, you didn't mention bone density as a uh, as an item, and I'm sure that came up in your review. Is there a threshold below which we ought not to operate? Well, certainly, any, I think anybody that's in my opinion. 
anything about his osteoporotic, absolutely not. I don't think so, unless they're unless you think you believe in these tethers and these junctional um, prophylactic measures. I didn't find anything in the literature or my review that gave us a definite T-score. Maybe somebody else in the audience would know, Larry? So well, mine is not, not at all. And, and part of it is honestly what you're doing for, you know, if I'm doing a revision of uh, a previous hair interrod fusion, I'm just grabbing the fusion mass in an osteoporotic patient going to the pelvis. That's different than doing a primary T2 to sacrum in a 75-year-old with a T-score minus 3.5. I mean, that, that's a really challenging, right? The second case is really challenging. The first one's, I think, doable, right? So it depends on the situation, as you know, and not, not just the T-score. Um, but, uh, but you know, in my, in my hands, and I agree with Dave asking that question, that, to me, is one of the biggest uh, uh, contributions, uh, contributors to PJK, especially PJF is uh, osteoporosis at the top of constructs, you know, when you, when you start at the pelvis, right, and you're going up from there, in the, uh, anywhere in the thoracic region. It's, it's, we haven't solved that yet, I don't think. Yeah, I think, I think Al Daniels wrote a paper about that topic in particular, Larry, when, he's, when he reviewed some cases where they, they had Harrington rods in, and he didn't touch the upper portion, just corrected the lower portion. He yeah, had exactly, right. 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 And you, just, you, you just basically grab under the fusion mass, you don't dissect above at all, and right. you're usually fine with that. But, um, but primary cases, you know, going, starting anywhere in the thoracic region, going to the pelvis and osteoporosis, I mean, I warn those patients if I do them that uh, they're high risk of having proximal problems. I mean, we, we have, even with tether cement, I don't think we, you know, not percutaneous instrumentation on top, nothing has seemed to solve it yet. Although the tethering does, you know, there, there seem to be some encouraging results, early results from uh, two level tethers, as you mentioned in your talk. So, yeah. I would, I would agree with all of that. I think um, it still remains an unsolved problem. Um, I started with cement 15 years ago or more, and uh, I, I found in my own practice, uh, similar to what you were showing, Bob, that uh, it seemed to delay de or accelerate degenerative disease. So it, it delayed the onset of need for revision, uh, but didn't eliminate it. And uh, I've gone to tethering, and I think proximal contour of the rod is critical. And then, um, you know, matching the alignment needs is critical, and all, all of those things are really reduce the level, if, uh, but not eliminated. And I'm a big believer in Forteo too, or some sort of anabolic uh, uh, bone density medication preoperatively and postoperatively in people who have even osteopenia. I try to get uh, my patients on that if we if we can do so. So great topic, a great talk. Uh, so uh, um, thank you so much, Bob.